Good morning, everyone. It's uh, good to see everybody here again after a week of rain. Good morning to everyone watching on Facebook or YouTube and to our visitors as well. If you are visiting us, you should have gotten a visitor's card. Please uh, fill that out and leave it with us so we can know you were here. Just a few announcements this morning before we get started. Uh, I wanted to share again the results of, of our deacon election in case you missed it last week. Uh, it's printed there in your bulletin. Steve Corbin, Sandy Harper, Rhonda Hutchinson, Danny Johnson, and Jack Tomlinson have all agreed to serve as deacons for the next three years. So thank you all for answering God's call and serving our church. Uh, speaking of which, there will be a deacon meeting this Tuesday at 7. Uh, and men's group will meet tonight at 4.30, and there will, always be, there will also be a men's prayer breakfast next Sunday morning at 8 o'clock. Sue, do you have anything? Uh, yeah, just a few things. A reminder for our ladies' Bible study. We held this evening over Zoom and tomorrow morning at the Pavilion, 1030. Uh, our family fun night that we had to uh, postpone uh, last week is going to be held a week from today, August the 30th. We're going to do it in the evening. So if you have children and teens, um, we would love to have you come and enjoy some games and some food together uh, here on the church grounds. So uh, we're going to start about 5 o'clock. So uh, if any of you all are interested, invite your friends, invite others, Lord, that um, you know that would like to come and participate. Uh, our friend of the week is uh, Betty Evers, so please remember her and also Petey this week. Um, in a little while, I'm going to invite any ladies who'd like to come up and join these ladies uh, in singing Because He Lives. Uh, they're right before the message time. So if you can gear up your courage, I have music for anybody who'd like to come and join us at that time. Let's worship the Lord in song. I'll invite you to stand and we'll sing together worthy of worship.
Let's pray. Father, it's been another long week, another long week of worries, of stress, of bad news, and yet we come here this morning to pause life for just a little while, to gather and worship you, to lift up our voices in prayer and song, to feel your presence in this place. Let your spirit hover over us, Father. Fill us with your love and goodness. Teach us what you know we need and guide our thoughts and hearts toward peace instead of turmoil, faith instead of fear, and hope in the face of so much unknown. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to join in singing once again some of the great hymns of our faith. What a friend we have in Jesus and leaning on the everlasting arms. And the scriptures for the basis of those hymns come out of Philippians and Deuteronomy. And it says in Philippians 4, 6, Don't worry about anything, but in everything, let your requests be made known to God. And then out of Deuteronomy, The God of old is your dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. So join these ladies in singing.
to uh, begin, and then we'll ask you to read in response uh, to their words. What does the Lord our God ask of us except to fear the Lord our God by walking in all his ways? Lord, lead us in your righteousness. Make your way straight before us. Make your ways known to us, Lord. Teach us your path. Guide us in your truth and teach us, for you are the God of our salvation. We wait for you all day long. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal encouragement and good hope and grace, encourage our hearts and strengthen us in good works and words to belong to Christ and Christ to God. Whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. All right, you brave ladies out there who want to come join us, I'll give you some music. Who's going to be the first one to come on up? Oh, Crystal. Give Crystal a hand. Yay. <laughs> oh, yeah, Sandy. Anybody else? Stella's coming. Lawrence is coming. Good. This beautiful hymn has um, been around since the 1970s. Uh, it's one that has stood the test of time and been an encouragement to my heart so many times and I'm sure the hearts of many others. Um, just reminds us that our lives may be uncertain and they may be full of anxiety and fear sometimes, but because Jesus lives in us, um, we can face whatever life brings us here on this earth. Uh, because he lives.
article this week about a poll that was conducted a few years ago. It was just one question. What statement do you most want to hear? Out of anything that can be said to you, what's the one thing you want to hear most? I'll give you the top three answers uh, that were given most often. You can probably guess two of them. The number one thing people want to hear is I love you. A close second was I forgive you. And the third, dinner is served. That's great, isn't it? it, it all of life boiled down to these three ones. And it didn't matter at all whether the people answering the poll were men or women, black or white, old or young, rich or poor, they all answered pretty much the same things. We spend our whole lives searching for these three things, working towards them and trying to keep hold of them. The problem is that we often look for these things in the wrong places. We try to get them ourselves rather than rely on God to provide them. And then when he doesn't provide them the way that we want him to, we get angry. And when we get angry, we start doubting him. His love, his presence, his promises. It happens all the time, doesn't it? We go to God with a deep need, and God doesn't seem interested in fulfilling it. We cried out to him, but it seems like nobody's there. We try to understand him, but we can't. And more than that, we know that we'll never understand some things on this side of life. We have the Bible and we have prayer and, and books and the wisdom of others, but the truth is that so much of God remains a mystery to us because our minds simply can't hold it. He's too great. He's too powerful. He's too holy. So what do we do when life gets so hard and our faith gets so complicated and God seems at best not to care and at worst, not real at all. What are our options whenever we start to question whether God is good? Well, one option is, is to do what many people do and just give up on God altogether. Just walk away from our faith and say, if I can't understand it, then I can't believe it. Or we can say, well, I don't understand any of this and I never will. Maybe God's there. Maybe he's not. But I'm just going to act like he is just in case. But God has a third option. He gives us permission to wrestle with him. Bring all of our doubts and worries and anger right to him and have it out. That might bother some of us. You know, we're taught at an early age that doubt when it comes to matters of religion means that we're lacking faith. That's not true at all. It takes a lot of faith to wrestle with our doubts. But when we're willing to wrestle him over our doubts and hurts and disappointments, that's when things start to change in our lives. That's when our souls are truly comforted. That's when our relationship with God deepens. And that brings us to one of the strangest stories in the entire Bible. When a man called Jacob wrestled with God the night before he was to meet the brother that he swindled. Turn your Bibles or your bulletins to Genesis 32. We'll be reading verses 22 through 30. The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. And this is God's word. You won't find a man quite like Jacob in all the Bible. Uh, his story in Genesis paints him as a coward, a thief, a con man, 
and ultimately a man of God. We all know the story of Jacob and Esau. Jacob stole his brother Esau's birthright, and Esau vowed revenge, so Jacob ran away to his uncle Laban. That didn't turn out very well for Jacob either, though, at least in some ways, because Laban was as much of a con man as Jacob was. But Jacob did marry two of Laban's daughters, Rachel and Leah, and he managed to become a wealthy shepherd. A little too wealthy, actually, which caused even more problems between Jacob and Laban. Then God commanded Jacob to pack up his family and his belongings and go back to the land of his birth. Jacob did as he was told, but now there's a problem. Jacob can't go back to Laban because that bridge has been burned now. But if he goes back home, he'll have to face the brother who vowed to kill him. So Jacob, being the shrewd guy that he is, sends messengers to Esau to try to fix their broken relationship. And you can imagine Jacob's fear when those messengers come back to say that Esau is on his way and he's bringing with him an army of 400 people. And that's where we pick up in verse 22. Jacob's sending his family and everything he has somewhere safe. Verse 23 says he sent them across the stream, but that word for stream is, is better translated as a ravine or a valley. He's putting his family on high ground atop one ridge while Esau is coming from the direction of the opposite ridge and Jacob's right there in the middle in a valley. Now think about what Jacob's feeling here. He's alone. It's dark. He's thinking about all the terrible things he's done in his life and, and he's looking for a way out, but there's not one. This is it for him. This is the end. I bet he's praying here. I bet Jacob's praying like he's never praying before. Asking God to show up, to help, to do something. He's thinking about the bad things he's done. All those lies he's told. And I bet he's also thinking about all those times God has shown him mercy in his life. Shown him guidance. Jacob's looking back over his life and seeing how God has woven every choice and every stumble into his will. And now he's crying out for God to show up. And here God comes. God will always come when we call him. Jacob was discouraged. He was afraid. And yet neither of those things didn't destroy his faith or silence his prayer. And so God comes. Verse 24 says it's a man. But it's not a man. And we'll get to that in a minute. This is God in human form. And we know who God in human form is, don't we? This is Christ. This is Christ visiting from heaven before he was born into the world ages later. Jacob cries out in his grief and fear and brokenness, and it's Christ who comes. Now think of Jacob again, out there all alone with Esau and an army coming at daybreak, needing a miracle, praying for one, and here one comes. God's come to help him. But instead of sitting down to talk, instead of God saying, don't worry now, Jacob, I got this, everything will be okay, what does God do? He doesn't offer Jacob rest, doesn't offer Jacob wisdom. Instead, he wrestles with Jacob until the breaking of the day. What in the world is happening here? Verses 24 and 25 are the only times in the entire Bible that the word wrestle occurs. And it's not between Cain and Abel. It's not written into an account of some great battle. It's right here between God and a man. It's as if God walked up to Jacob in that dark valley and said, I'm here, Jacob. What are you going to do with me? And in all of Jacob's fear and doubt and worry and all of his frustrations that have built up over a lifetime, he can do nothing but grapple with God. We see here in verse 24 two important things. One, when do we wrestle with God? When our lives become like Jacob's. When we're stripped of all of our worldly treasures. When we lose a family member or a job or our health. When we suffer a broken relationship. When the world feels like it's crashing down all around us and God makes no sense anymore and we cry out to him, where are you? That's when God shows up and says, let's wrestle. Because he doesn't ask you to hide your pain from him. 
He doesn't tell you to stop asking questions and just deal with it. He says, you don't think I'm here? I'm always here. And if it feels like you can't find me, it's because you moved. That's the first point. That's when we wrestle with God. But then there's the question of how all of this takes place. And to answer that, we have to look at a couple things. We have to look at how Jacob wrestles with God, and we also have to look at how God wrestles with Jacob. Because these are very different things. With Jacob, we see that we wrestle in our messiness. Jacob's no saint. He's done some terrible things in his life. But God wrestles with him anyway. We don't need to get ourselves right before we go to God. We don't need to clean ourselves up because we can't. God's the one who gets us right. God's the one who cleans us up. And then there's a more powerful picture of a perfect and holy God's love than, than showing up to wrestle a filthy, sinful human being. Actually, there is a better picture, and it's all in how God wrestles with Jacob. We have to get our minds straight on, on what's happening here exactly, because it's not what we really think. We think of a wrestling match as a physical thing, but the wrestling match that's going on here between God and Jacob isn't just physical, it's spiritual too. This story is mentioned in another book of the Old Testament, the book of Hosea, and in Hosea 12, 4, we read of the two weapons Jacob used in his wrestling match with God. Prayers and tears. He's not just wrestling. He's praying. He's crying out. Jacob's bearing his soul. He's sweating and screaming and begging. He's digging his feet into the dirt, trying to get a grip. His hands are searching for a soft spot, groping for a place where he can get leverage. And what's God doing? Is God wrestling too? Well, in, in a way, in, in a way, it's, it, it's like how I would wrestle with Will, my son, when he was a boy. You know, Will wasn't any taller than this, and he weighed about 30 pounds, and we'd wrestle all the time. He'd come at me with everything he had, kicking and punching and clawing, and I'd return the favor, but I'd use about 5% of my strength. You know, hold his head, and he'd be flailing at me. He wouldn't, you know, that's, that's what's going on here. I can't do that anymore because Will's bigger than I am. But what God, this is what God's doing with Jacob. Jacob's kicking and punching and clawing and crying and screaming. That's how Jacob wrestles with God. That's how we wrestle with God. But that's how, not how God wrestles with us. And that's where that best picture of a loving and holy God comes in because it's right there in verse 25. It sounds brutal, doesn't it? That last part, when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Jacob's wrestling, but it's not with his own strength that he wrestles. It's not by Jacob, own, Jacob's own strength that he prevails. He only wins with the strength that God gives him. Jacob could have been squashed like an ant at any time but he's like us. The only way we can prevail against God is with God's own strength. So what does God do? He puts out Jacob's thigh. Now what does that accomplish? First, it makes Jacob realize that this isn't a man he's wrestling. No man can put out another man's hip this easily. That's something only God can do. Up until this moment, Jacob's thinking this is just some guy. Maybe he's thinking this is a traveler making his way through the valley and wanting to rob him. Or maybe this is one of Esau's spies. Now he realizes this is God I'm dealing with. But watch this now because this is so important. This is everything in this story right here. How does God put out Jacob's hip socket? He doesn't punch it. He doesn't kick it. He doesn't even reach out and jab it. He touches it. And how is it that God can touch Jacob's hip? Only one way. If God is holding it. Jacob's flailing his fists and kicking his legs. God's hugging him. 
And the more Jacob fights to break free, the tighter God embraces him. We assume that since they're wrestling and Jacob's hip is thrown out, that it's a violent thing, but it's not. God's actually helping Jacob in this match. It's Jesus here, so we know there's not going to be any violence. Jacob thinks he's fighting, but he's really being changed by the embrace of Christ, just as we all are. And that is the picture of God's love. We punch and kick, he hugs. We scream, he comforts. We want to run away, he holds us tight. We think we can stand on our own, he shows us that we can. That's what he shows Jacob with that touch. And why did God touch him there? Because the thigh is the foundation of our strength. All of our physical strength comes from the legs. And the spot where the thigh joins with the hip is the source of any wrestler's power. If the thigh bone is thrown out of joint, we are utterly disabled. Jacob's just found that this mysterious wrestler has taken all of his strength, all of his power, and he can't stand alone anymore. He can't support himself. So what does he do? He slumps right into the arms of the God he's wrestling with. And in that moment, Jacob learns the one lesson God's been trying to teach him all of his life. He has to lean on somebody who's more powerful than himself. This is the turning point in this story right here. Notice what happens. Jacob's hip has just been broken, but he keeps fighting. He even talks in the next verse. Do you think he could fight and talk with a broken hip? No way. All you can do is lie down and scream. But that doesn't happen here. God broke Jacob's hip while also making sure Jacob wasn't hurt. God broke Jacob and healed him at the same time. The object wasn't to make Jacob feel pain, but for Jacob to learn this one thing that he had never learned before. And that's a hard lesson because now Jacob can barely walk. He can't fight at all. He couldn't have gotten the best of Esau in a fight anyway, but now he can't even run away. He's defeated, and he's broken, and he's right where God wants him to be. Because now Jacob won't let go. God says in verse 26, let me go, for the day is broken. The night's done. Dawn's come. Esau's on his way, and Jacob has work to do. But Jacob says, I don't care if it's day. I don't care who's coming for me. I won't let you go. I finally have you. And I won't let you go. So bless me. Jacob knows he's in the arms of a higher power. A holy God who can disable without pain. And Jacob knows that if God can do that, then God can bless him. He finally knows how helpless he's always been and how helpless he'll always be without God's healing power and grace. Of all Jacob's faults, and he had a lot. The one that caused him the most trouble was that he always thought Esau was the biggest problem in his life. But the truth was that his biggest problem was he'd spent his entire life wrestling against God. Esau wasn't the problem. It was Jacob's lack of trust and it all, all of his lying and the way he manipulated everybody in his life. And when that truth finally comes to him, Right there in God's arms. He suddenly realizes that he's no longer wrestling against God, but for God. And he cries out, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now what's he asking for here? When, when we give a blessing to someone, it's not much more than a nice wish. But when God gives a blessing, he's promising fullness of life. He's promising love and joy and meaning. Jacob started out wrestling God out of his despair and his doubt. He started out swinging his arms and his legs while God held tight. But here at the end, Jacob realizes that he's wrestling to become one of God's blessed children. He's wrestling for a deeper sense of God's presence. He's wrestling not so he can beat God or make God follow his plan. Jacob's wrestling God because he wants more of God. 
And that's why now he's the one holding on tight. And that's exactly how we have to wrestle too. It's going to God with all of our hurts and doubts and sadness, with every ounce of our grief, and not saying, why have you done this to me? But saying, Lord, I am not going to let you go no matter what. And I don't care how hard I have to hang on. I don't care how long I have to hang on. I only care that you bless me. But God doesn't give Jacob his blessing right away. Something else has to come first. And we see that in verse 27. It's a question to Jacob. What is your name? Now, we've talked about God's questions, haven't we? Every time God asks a question in, in the Bible, it's not because he wants to know something. It's so we can know something. Jacob answers by giving his name. And what does the name Jacob mean? Trickster. Liar. There's a kind of judgment going on here, isn't there? God asks for Jacob's name, and Jacob gives it, but along with that name is the meaning of that name. And that brings back to Jacob's mind all of the terrible things he's done in his life. All of those lies and all of that cheating he did just because he didn't trust God. But it's also a judgment that's given with love rather than hate because Jacob is remembering all of that, but he's still in God's arms. God is still holding on to him. And now God says in verse 28, your name shall no longer be called Jacob. For all of Jacob's life, he's been defined by his name. He came out of the womb holding on to his twin brother's heel. And ever since he's done one thing after another to get ahead, no matter what the cost is. He has no relationship with his family. He has no relationship with his uncle Laban. And Esau, Jacob's brother, is on the way. But God says that doesn't matter anymore. He says to Jacob, you won't be known any longer as the plotting cheater. You'll be known as the humble servant in my hands. Your name will be Israel, which means God prevails. Because when you wrestled with me and depended on yourself, you couldn't win. But when you depend on me, you can never lose. But it's more than that. God gives Jacob the new name Israel because he says you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. You've prevailed, Jacob. You've overcome. And isn't that what life is all about in the end? Enduring, persisting, overcoming, never give up on God and never give in to anything but God. But what exactly had Jacob overcome? If we go back to the beginning with Jacob and Esau, you can't really call buying your brother's birthright for a bowl of stew overcoming. Getting dressed up like your brother so you can trick your father into blessing you is not overcoming. But that's what Jacob did. Jacob was never really honest with his uncle Laban either. Both of them were always more concerned about themselves than with each other. To the point where they decided the best thing they could do was just never see each other again. That is not overcoming. So what did Jacob overcome that night? He overcame himself. Right there in God's embrace, he saw himself truly for the first time. He understood that he'd spent his entire life trying to get what God had promised him in his own way, and by his own schemes, instead of trusting, instead of having faith. Jacob asked in verse 29, please tell me your name. God tells him, why are you asking me my name, Jacob? Don't you know? Is there anyone else but me who can give you a new name? And there, God blesses him. Naming something, especially in the Old Testament, is a big deal. Naming something gives it a power. God gave Jacob a new name, a new identity. And in turn, Jacob names the place where he wrestled with God. In verse 30, we see the name of that place is Peniel, which means facing God. For I have seen God face to face, he says, and yet my life has been delivered. Not just spared. God did spare Jacob's life in the sense that he could have killed Jacob any time he wanted. But that's not what Jacob means. He means rescued. He means his life has been given anew. He means his soul was saved. 
because he wrestled with God. We get a last picture of Jacob in verse 31 as he leaves that place to go meet Esau. And pay attention to that last phrase there, limping because of his hip. Jacob's life would never be the same after that night. You don't experience God and remain the same as you were before. Jacob would limp for the rest of his life. That hip would never heal. And that means that anybody whom God blesses will come away with a limp. God will give you something in your life that leaves no doubt that you cannot lean on yourself. You have to lean on him. Jacob's limp is so tied to his blessing that it's mentioned in Hebrews 11, that famous chapter, the Hall of Faith. In verse 21, the writer of Hebrews mentions Jacob's walking staff. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of the staff. It's almost like out of all the things Jacob experienced in his life, everything he endured, Hebrews 11.21 means to say that in the end, Jacob was faithful because he had to lean on God. He's limping off here to meet Esau, the twin brother who promised vengeance. And notice what Jacob doesn't know here. He has no idea how this meeting is going to go. God has given Jacob no indication at all that he's going to make it through that day. But also notice what Jacob does know. God is with him. And that's enough. A relationship with God is better than any of God's blessings. Are you wrestling with God right now? Good. There aren't many things in life more valuable than that if you do it right. Because God will get hold of you. God will twist your arm. But remember that Jacob didn't win that wrestling match by pinning God. He won by being pinned. Jacob won by losing, because it's in the losing, it's in that limp, that he finally bowed himself before God's plan and God's power. God rules us when we wrestle him, but when he rules us, we win, because that's when we're blessed. And when he cuts us, he cuts us to heal. One more point to make before we close. If you look back in Scripture, you'll find something interesting. Genesis 28 is Jacob's dream of a ladder reaching to heaven. And God standing at the top of that ladder and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. And in chapter 31, Jacob is talking to Laban and says, If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac, and in chapter 32, verse 9, just before God comes into that valley to meet Jacob, Jacob prays to God and says, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac. These verses all have something in common, don't they? In all of them, God is the father of Abraham. In all of them, God is the father of Isaac. But nowhere in the Bible does it say that God is the God of Jacob until after they wrestled. Why is that? Remember those three answers I told you at the beginning about what most people want to hear? When we wrestle with God, we hear those three things. We go to Him in our anger and frustration and tears. He holds us tight and says, I love you. We go to Him in our failures and our sins. He holds us tight and says, I forgive you. We go to him in our loneliness. He holds us tight and says, come with me. Dinner's ready. And the food and drink I have will never leave you hungry or thirsty again. That is our God. And as we close our service with prayer and song, if you've never met him, if you're tired of holding on to all that anger and sadness inside, come up here and someone will pray with you. Let's pray. Father, you're such a great and loving God, and oh, so mysterious, so holy. You see what we cannot see and know what we cannot know. Forgive us our doubts. We believe, Father, help our unbelief. We thank you for a grace and mercy that allows us to wrestle with you through the dark times of our lives, through all of our fears and worries, as we punch and kick 
and you hold us tight. In all things, Father, we win by losing to you. We rise up by bowing down to you. We find our way forward by being led by you. Help us to remember that and bless us as we go out from this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll invite you to stand as we sing our closing hymn of commitment. Now may the strength of God sustain us, may the power of God preserve us, may the hands of God protect us, may the way of God direct us, may the love of God go with us this day and forever. The Lord bless us and keep us, the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us, amen. Have a good week everybody.